Yes. It's not easy. It, like getting guests on, scheduling them, figuring out what, what are we going to talk about and how long should it be? And where does this get published and how do I promote it? I mean, all look, of it. Look how long it took for us to set this yeah, up. This is, and then I got the wrong headset and I had to wait for Amazon to be like, it's, yeah. it takes a lot of time and thought and energy and podcasters need to prepare for that and uh, prepare themselves to be the most successful podcaster they can be. And that means scheduling your content, like actually like having a plan of attack right? Mm -hmm. Like, what is your point of view? What do you have to say that's unique? Flight out. Create content. Welcome back to the Beetle Moment Marketing Podcast. I'm your host, Emily Bender, and I am here with my very special guest, Tess Newdeck. Tess serves as the manager of marketing for ACAST in the Americas, and she's responsible for shaping ACAST's marketing strategy across its 10,000 plus podcasts, its advertiser business, and all of the products and services that the company creates for podcasters, advertisers, and listeners. Tess began her career on the agency side, spending more than eight years at MediaVest, which is now Spark Foundry, performing print and digital media planning and buying for a wide array of clients across almost every industry. Uh, prior to ACAST, Tess oversaw marketing at Urban Daddy and managed sales marketing for legendary brands like Sports Illustrated and Fortune. Hi, Tess. Welcome to the show. Hi. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. You and I have been kind of in connection for, I think, at least a year or so, just talking through all things podcast related and voice and I just think that ACAST is such a wonderful tool. It's what I personally host uh, my show on. This is not sponsored in any way, but I just think, you know, Tess, ACAST, you guys are doing a great job and I wanted to get you on and just talk about all things podcasting. Thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. So we can start with just talking through basically the state of podcasting right now during the pandemic and what have you kind of seen? I mean, I know everyone's saying how podcasting is on the uptick and it's, it's really growing and popular. What have you noticed even just here in 2020 with kind of the Corona economy and podcasting? Yeah. Uh, it's interesting because we hear so many people come to us and say, oh, podcasting must be down because nobody can commute to work and that's the only place they're listening. And I'm here to tell you that that is straight up false. Um, we've seen more than 10% increase in listens since the pandemic started. And we're just noticing that commuting is clearly not the only place that people are listening and they're replacing that with listening in other places and forms. So it's more like a flattening of, of the day parts. So people are just listening constantly to podcasts, which is awesome because there's about a million podcasts out there. So there's so much content for people to consume. Uh, and we're seeing podcasting as a space where people are able to really develop and uh, hone their voice. So it's truly an exciting time to be in audio right now. Yeah. So you're saying that people are listening constantly. Does that mean that they might be streaming it like on a mobile device while they're working from home or what does that look like? We've actually seen a massive increase in smart speaker listeners. Uh, so people are using their Google voice, their Alexa, uh, whatever it may be within their home listening while they're doing chores, that's one of the top activities actually. So while they're vacuuming, um, now that people are working from home, it's very easy to have podcasts going in the background. Uh, you don't have coworkers to complain when you've got a little voice off to the side. So people are able to listen throughout the day, whether it's you know while they're getting up, showering and brushing their teeth or while they're preparing dinner. It doesn't have to be this simple, you know, to from work situation. Right. So, you know, instead of we are missing out on that commute time, there's actually more opportunity to listen. Absolutely. <laughs> that makes sense to me. Uh, so you mentioned smart speakers and obviously I follow that space very closely and work uh, a lot with voice marketing and voice assistants. And I thought this was so interesting. I remember, I think it was morning 
Morning Brew came out with some stats back in April and said that during the first four weeks of stay-at-home measures, smart speaker use was up 34%. And podcasting is such a natural, it's if I would say the number one most natural form of content for smart speakers with it being just hands-free, germ-free, convenient, audio voice first. Um, what are you seeing with podcasting and smart speakers or voice assistants and kind of like where are podcasters in relation to figuring out are we optimized to be there? Are, are we just, you know, we're on tune in, so check the box. What does that look like? I think people are still figuring it out. Um, from a listener's perspective, it's super seamless, right? You can ask your smart speaker to simply fire up your favorite show. Um, I think there's still moments and places for us to grow, for advertisers and brands to grow within that space if they want to optimize their message for those listening specifically to smart speakers. But I think people are maybe taking a bit of a wait and see approach there as well. Mm -hmm. So that reminds me, we were talking just before we started recording about big news in the podcast world, Joe Rogan experience going to Spotify exclusively. And for anyone that missed this news, Spotify and Joe Rogan, which is, it's the number one podcast, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. It's like Mark Marin, WTF, Joe Rogan. These are the top, top listened to. And Spotify now has exclusive rights. This will start in the fall where the Joe Rogan experience will only be available on Spotify. And this is big because I, I mean, to me, this spells kind of the future of how are we monetizing this and where will it live and who's going to start kind of clamoring to get some of the top content on their platform? Yeah, I think it's not necessarily how we operate at ACAST to make anything fully exclusive. Uh, we were founded upon the ideas of truly the democratization of audio and making amazing premium content available to everybody, regardless of where you listen. So we're platform agnostic. Our shows are available wherever you get your podcasts, which is kind of a beautiful thing, right? Like if you want that content, you can get it. You don't have to pay for it. That said, we're super supportive of making money. We want we believe that our creators are doing amazing things in the space and they should be compensated for that work. Uh, so we recognize the benefits of establishing and evolving several different monetization streams, right? Rev or revenue streams, I should say. So whether that's the supporter feature that we actually just launched at Acast, which allows you to, or listeners to provide one-off um, not sponsorship, but one off. Is it support. donations? Little yeah. tips? Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can, it allows you, you might be able to access a bonus issue or early release of content or simply support your favorite creators. That's one amazing way for our creators to make money and to feel the love of this community that they've developed because podcasters truly do create these amazing tight knit communities. Um, we're also here to support across live shows, which is another amazing way to create revenue for yourself as a podcaster. So it doesn't, it's not necessary to build an exclusive relationship with one partner. That's certainly a way to go and might be a wonderful way for podcast Sorry, Joe Rogan. Right, with yeah. this <laughs> massive built in audience. Um, but there are so many podcasters out there who don't have a million listeners per week Most, at the top. You well, know, fifty percent of podcasters pod fade. The ones who are still standing and creating content on whatever their cadence, weekly, biweekly, like my show, I do it every other Monday. It's a slog. It's a lot of work, and I think it's great that you've come out with um, what is the feature called with the supporter. So it's called the supporter feature. <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful because this is this is where content in many ways has to go, which is to to pay for quality. When you look at journalism, we can't we can't keep expecting to have really great quality content for free 
or we get into this boat where everything is assumed to be free and no one's going to pay for the quality production and then there is less quality. So it's okay to ask people to support your show. You know, Tim Ferriss did an experiment with this and it actually didn't go very well, but the experimentation I think is, is the beauty of it. You can see yeah. what works if it doesn't change course. Absolutely. There's so many ways for creators to shake up their, their platform, if you will. Uh, and you might need to do a little test and learn to figure out what works best for you. What works for one podcaster in one genre, even of podcast might not work for another. So you got to kind of play around a little bit. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, you were talking about the, the democratization and that you support that. And I love that. Um, that's kind of the beauty of all of this with, with social media, with podcasting, with everybody jumping into this. And, and it's not about having a million people listen. It's about having the right audience, whoever that may be, however big it is. Yeah. It's, look, we hear it all the time now that anybody can make a podcast, right? Yeah. As long as yeah. you have like a cell phone and you, know, you can crank something out in your mom's basement if you want to. Doesn't mean all podcasts are winners. <laughs> uh, yeah. But, but truly, it is, it is something that anyone can do with the right tools and resources. And that's something that we at ACAST feel very strongly about as well. So one thing that we do is we sort of work to help creators be set up for success in that way. Um, making sure that you have the right data and analytics available to you, uh, workshops to attend so you can sort of sharpen your craft, if you will, understanding audience and promotion and best practices. Having all of those tools ready and available to you is part of democratizing audio and making it, uh, you know, it's only really for everyone if everyone has those tools. Right, you. right. Yeah, that's true. And what you touched on about everyone has a podcast, like it's common, right? But it's less common for those podcasts to be consistent, to be thoughtful, to be good, to have a real plan behind them. And that, that gets into the voice marketing strategy, which I think if you do have a podcast, you should have a strategy for it. Don't just start and cross your fingers. Oh my God. There has to be a plan in place. Yes. It's not easy. It, like getting guests on, scheduling them, figuring out what, what are we going to talk about and how long should it be? And where does this get published and how do I promote it? I mean, all look, of it. Look how long it took for us to set this yeah, up. This is, and then I got the wrong headset and I had to wait for Amazon to be like, it, yeah. it takes a lot of time and thought and energy and Podcasters need to prepare for that and uh, prepare themselves to be the most successful podcaster they can be. And that means scheduling your content, like actually like having a plan of attack, right? Mm -hmm. Like what is your point of view? What do you have to say that's unique? Flight out, create a content plan and schedule with guests, with backup guests because somebody inevitably will have to reschedule batch up those episodes so that you can you know churn them out on a weekly or bi-weekly basis so that your audience can come to expect that content from you because once they're there once they're ready to to listen you need to be ready to give them that content have it you know automatically download straight to their feed uh, and then you have to put in the work to market yourself like you have to be ready to put yourself out there. You have to network. You have to, whether that means going out for virtual coffees with others in the space or, you know, joining Facebook groups for female podcasters of color, if that is something that works for you um, or getting yourself into the queer podcast podcaster space, if you fall into that space as well. Um, working on cross promotion, guesting, co-hosting, being open to sponsorships, you name it, you know, just putting yourself out there is a huge part of the process. 
That's true. And I think a lot of people listening to this show, we have people who are in marketing and advertising, people who are in the voice world, some people who are in the financial services space, kind of like a cross section of different industries. And One thing that I've learned as someone who's hosted podcasts, I started podcasting in 2012 on a show with a friend of mine called the Digital Dive Podcast. And it was like terrible sound quality and we were really dorky, but we were trying something out. And you know, that's eight years ago. Things are so much easier now. It's just plug and play. You can sound good for a hundred (laughs) bucks. Yeah. But you know, with what you said about the sponsorships and the advertising and the partners and the collaboration and networking and all of that, that's a, that's a huge part of it. Like from a professional development standpoint, everyone that I've ever had as a guest on this podcast becomes somebody that I value in my network and that we've connected and had a conversation and we just so happened to record it. Like, and yeah. it's a win-win for everyone involved. Like, that's, a, that's a real benefit of having guests on as a podcaster. It's not about look at me, look at me. <laughs> You know, it's let's share information. Let's let's elicit this from that person who knows all about podcast hosting uh, mm-hmm. and what's going on in the industry. And sometimes it is all look at me, look at me. But you have to know your niche, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. there's a whole section of or whole genre of podcasts that are you know chat shows where it's just one or two people talking. You know, like some of those are hugely successful. But it's cool to see the evolution of the space with all sorts of new formats yeah. coming, breaking into the scene. Like there's, there are game show podcasts now. Really? Okay. Like that's a totally new format. <laughs> Any and, good ones that I should check out? Um, yes. we, yeah. we have one called Sex for Money. Is okay. That's a podcast, which is really interesting. That's a game show. Another one that... Um, that I've been listening to is called Food Fight. So it's pitting two people with very strong food opinions against oh, each other. That sounds really entertaining. It is actually. Uh, like love or hate right. cilantro. I don't know. Is ranch better than blue cheese? Let's find out. Um, and yeah, and then there's the opportunity to host an interview show where you can really learn something from guests. So it's all about kind of finding your niche and your very specific point of view and making that work for you. I think people are just hungry for something delightful and lighthearted and just a show with levity. Like I love Scam Goddess. Have you ever listened to that podcast? Yes. <sighs> Lacey Mosley, brilliant, hilarious. And I'm, that's like my dessert. Every night before bed, I've tried to you know, limit my blue, blue light and screens and I'll just listen to Scam Goddess, you know, not looking at the screen and um, that's so good. But then, you know, I'll also have my vegetables. Like I'll listen to masters in business or I'll listen to, you know, so many of the other podcasts that are about like pivot. I can't get enough pivot with Scott Galloway and Kara Swisher. It's like twice a week. If that's the only show I listen to about business and tech, like I'm informed. Right. Absolutely. I think podcasts have the ability to really educate all sorts of audiences in a fun and enlightening way um, that, I mean, you're literally right in someone's ear, right? Like talk about having a captive audience. Like you are talking to people one-on-one. It's a pretty powerful way to get a message across. One of my current favorite podcasts right now is called Inappropriate Questions. And it's basically two diverse, hosts, one of whom you would call is a Sikh and you would call, you know, a well-meaning dad, um, which means he doesn't know everything about everything. And he asks, he's guilty of asking those awkward and invasive questions that plenty of us are guilty of asking. Um, Even though it comes from a good place, he's here to learn. He's here to improve himself and understand the right way to ask some of these questions. So every episode is about, will attach itself to an expert in the space. So anything from why don't you drink or um, what are you in terms of race or ethnicity or can you have sex or have you had that surgery? All those things like (laughs) be careful, Mm. don't ask, but it helps it helps you understand why you shouldn't be asking those questions in a certain way and how you can educate yourself and learn. And it's, it's still told in this 
manner that makes me excited to learn something new and is still comforting in a way. Uh, I don't listen. It's a great, it's a great listen. <laughs> Okay. Well, we'll have links to everything that Tess has recommended in the show notes at beetlemoment.com slash podcast. So you've already mentioned a few of the podcasts that you like. Were there any others that you just think our audience definitely needs to check out? Um, I also really like The Alarmist. I haven't heard of any of these. This is great. The Alarmist is fun. It basically, the idea is trying to figure out who's to blame for some of the biggest travesties in our history. So whether that's the Triangle Shirtwaist fire or- Ooh, that's a good one. Right? Or the breakup of the Beatles, like <laughs> who's at fault? And they'll just kind of sit there, talk through it, get their hands dirty on a whiteboard and figure out, you know, was it Yoko or no? Like who's to blame? Um, <laughs> and they go through the history and it's, it's a good thing to kind of like geek out on a little bit. That sounds great. Well, um, I think for me, podcasting is, is a really exciting medium. I love incorporating video. And you mentioned earlier the live streaming feature. And mm -hmm. I just last week had a conversation with this guy named Wall Street Booyah, who he's a Twitch broadcaster and he does financial news, but it's on Twitch, which you think Twitch is for gaming and music and like Fortnite, but no, it's actually also for stock charts and watching CNBC and having like a live running commentary. It's, I think it could be kind of a future of podcasting and live broadcasting. Um, it's like so interesting, but the interactivity, that's something where you could say that's kind of missing from current podcasting. Like how, how do you see that playing out where audiences can interact more with the show or share it more easily? Yeah, I think live shows are becoming at least for, particularly for those top tier podcasters are becoming both a new source of revenue and just a new format and um, way for them to engage with their audiences. If it's live, yes, it's recorded and can then be uploaded as a podcast, but you have a full audience in the room who's able to raise their hand and ask questions and go up on stage. Um, and it, it's, there's, when there's a conversation, I think something really lovely can happen um, and you're able to, to expand upon and touch on new topics. So I think that's something that you'll see more of moving forward. Um, and I think also just utilizing all the touch points that are available to you. So I think you'll see more of this where a podcast is being recorded and then also uploaded onto a YouTube channel. Um, where people are responding to a live Twitter stream that is directed straight to a podcast host that they can answer while they're recording. Um, you've got highly interactive Facebook groups and Instagram communities that are bubbling up and, um, and allow for a conversation to happen. Absolutely. Well, speaking of conversation, where can people connect with you and follow you on social media, online? Sure. Well, if you're looking for work stuff for ACAST stuff, that's at ACAST for the stories on Instagram or at ACAST on Twitter. For me personally, um, I'm at Tessie Pie, T-E-S-S-Y-P-I-E on Instagram and Twitter. And I have a website or blog. Uh, it's called peaches to apples.com. So I think I know, <laughs> I bet I can, I can guess what that's from. So you're from Savannah, Georgia, mm -hmm. peach state. And now you live in New York. Did I get it? You did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's great. So everybody connect with Tess Nudek, follow her on social, check out ACAST and show notes are at beetlemoment.com slash podcast. Tess Nudek, this has been fabulous. Thank you so much for coming on the show and can't wait to see what you and ACAST come out with next for podcasters. Thank you. This has been so much fun. Yeah.